I'm Bill Cobb. This is the Church of St. Clement. I'm saying this because these are going to be on our, our website eventually. And um, we're in the history of revivals. And this is my next to the last class, at least as far as I know. I'm not quite sure about the first Sunday in, in, um, in July. Um, and I was just saying a moment ago that next Sunday I'm going to show another video by J. N. Winord, which is on the Welsh Revival, which I watched last night, and it's just fantastic. Uh, so I may have to have another week, um, either the, the 7th of July or at some point in the future. May need more than one, I don't know. But in any case, so the video last week wasn't exactly the one I was thinking it was. It was very close. It had a lot of overlapping material. And, and J. Edwin Ord got into the first and second great awakening. So I wanted to recap a little bit about the second, second great awakening. Uh, approximately, these are approximate uh, 1790 to 1840, where Western New York, Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, Southern Ohio involving Methodists and Baptists, to a lesser extent, Presbyterians, the Cumberland Mes Presbyterians. Uh, it, it was a revival that took place under, uh, among less educated and wealthy people than the First Great Awakening. A greater percentage of women and young people were converted. Now, the preaching style was very emotional, very emotional and in the Second Great Awakening, and so... I mean, it kind of makes sense that there were more women converted under it and young people because uh, men tend to not respond as much to an emotional message. Uh, you can argue with me about that later, but anyway. Um, um, actually, I think there's some recent studies on or recent phenomena on this as well. But anyway, um, so... The main leaders, in, so there were three phases of the Second Great Awakening, Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, James McGrady, Barton Stone, John McGee. Uh, these names are probably unfamiliar to you unless you study this. Uh, the second phase was in New England, Dwight, Timothy Dwight, Lyman Beecher, etc. I didn't have, want to put all the names in. Western New York, Charles Finney. You probably have heard of Charles Finney. And Charles Finney was the first kind of professional evangelist. He was an attorney. He was an attorney. Uh, he was the president of Oberlin College. And he, um, and he left his practice to preach. And he, uh, he was he organized his revivals. He sent a team to a city at a time. This is standard stuff for the Billy Graham Association, Franklin Graham and those now. They sent a team ahead. They get everything organized and all that. Well, before him, everything was pretty spontaneous. And, and he was greatly criticized by some um, for his, not his organizational skills, but for I think the accusation was that it was it was it was it was more him than God doing it, right? I mean he had a lot of fruit. A lot of people came to Christ in his meetings in in western New York and then he spread throughout the United States and over to England and preached in all the major cities in England. But um and he and so Charles Finney was um was uh very effective but he, uh, he spoke in a very common parlance. He, wasn't, he didn't have any highfalutin theological language, but, um, and people responded to him. Um, anyway, the characteristics were of this revival were that people came to Christ during revival meetings. Again, very emotional appeals. Um, there was a shift from Calvinism to Arminian theology, um, there were Methodist circuit riders. I was told that one of my great uncles was a Methodist circuit rider um, down in, I believe he was down in Louisiana. Uh, any case, these, these guys would, were l mostly lay preachers who went out as far as they could go 
and reached the, the you know, the wild west of Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, and, and then further out on the frontier, um, dozens of new denominations were created, including uh, numerous free black churches, so formerly slaves, freed black churches. The, the, in the Second Great Awakening, they, the, the preachers would preach to anyone, you know, women, men, slaves, didn't matter. It was very egalitarian, very egalitarian. And, uh, and so um, creation of religious movements, Adventism uh, was really big. And out of this, the Seventh-day Adventist church came, uh, which has a unique set of beliefs. They believe in keeping the literal Sabbath, Saturday. Uh, but it all, uh, the Adventism was a movement that affected many denominations that focused on the second coming of Christ and um, and I believe they were post-millennialists. The, 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 the mood at the time was post-millennialism. And what that meant was that they believed that God was going to usher in the thousand-year reign of Christ, and then Christ would, would come, if I have that right. I may not have that right. I think that's right. Uh, but contrary to today, to thinking that, most evangelicals think things are going to go to hell in a handbasket before the Lord returns. Back then, the common belief among evangelical Protestants was that, that they were, the church was to usher in the kingdom of God through social programs. That we are to improve the world and get it ready for Christ's second coming. That was the prevailing theology, popular theology of that time. And it's very different than, than today. Um, so you had the Adventists, um, uh, dispensationalists like Schofield, who wrote, who has the Schofield Bible. He wrote the notes for that, who divided uh, history into periods of time. And that's where the idea that the, the apostolic uh, miracles ceased with the apostles, uh, which is a common belief among a lot of uh, traditional Baptists and such. Um, I mean, they believe in prayer, they believe in miracles, but they don't believe there are gifts of the Spirit that operate today. Um, and then uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you might not want to consider that. It, it is a... It is a it is a, these all um, came out of the same time. Joseph Smith was, of course, a, uh, a science fiction writer of the day who uh, decided to, to write the Book of Mormon and plagiarize the King James Bible with 15,000 quotes. And they can do this by textual analysis. And, and so, uh, of course, the, the golden tablets that he claims the angel Moroni, get it, Moroni? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, was he messing with people? Uh, the, the, the angel Moroni, um, he, he had a special pair of glasses that he translated them and they disappeared anyway. Uh, so that was uh, what the Joseph Smith uh, came on the scene and, and started the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, so all these things happened out of the, the Second Great Awakening. It resulted in, again, founding of colleges and seminaries and Bible societies, social movements in, involving, te invol involving temperance, leading to prohibition in, the 19, in 1920. Now, temperance was not only about alcohol. Um, it was also about pornography and prostitution. Uh, and uh, uh, we had prostitution in El Paso open prostitution until the early part of the 20th century. It was the men's group of St. Clement's Church that got the city council to pass a law against it. Did you know that? And, uh, but that didn't exactly end it. They passed a law. They passed a rule. But um, interestingly enough, um, it was shortly after that that and this, of course, was known as Sin City back then. This was the original Sin City in the West. Shortly after that, a new Sin City was, was uh, created in Las Vegas. 
shortly after that. It's all in the history, right, Melanie? Yeah, it's all in our history. So, um, in any case, prohibition, uh, abolition, uh, of course, abolition, the abolitionist movement began before we were even a country, back in, 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 in the colonies. There were colonies that didn't have slaves and forbade them from the beginning, and, and, the, and so it took a long time to have a, it, it took the Civil War to completely, uh, to completely uh, free the slaves, and they, even then they weren't freed automatically. It, it took time after that, but that was, uh, that was the result. And then women's rights, suffrage, the suffrage movement. Um, so all these kind of came out were in the late 1800s. Um, so the third great awakening I want to get into, um, I wrote United States and Korea. Actually, it was in the United States, but there were similar movements in England and Korea at the time. I should have edited that. I, ch I meant to change that. So, uh, but there were very similar movements. Uh, this Third Great Awakening, and not everyone agrees on the number of, of revivals. They might call this a wave of revival. They might say it's part of the Second Great Awakening. Um, but this is just using this particular model. Um, it involved Protestant denominations, not so much as reaching lost as those in the pews who were in Protestant churches. Uh, again, it was post-millennial. Um, it was the social gospel. The social gospel, which came out. So in, in the first Great Awakening, you can see the seeds of the temperance movement, prohibition or abolition uh, and women's rights. In the Third Great Awakening, these things came to fruition because it was 1855 to 1930. It involved Protestant denominations. Again, post-millennialism had a very positive view of, of the, the church's ability to impact society and uh, morally. And, and part of this came out of the, the Reformation of manners, if you will, that they saw from the first, the first Great Awakening. And so all these movements were started to improve society, to get rid of slavery, to uh, give women the vote, to, um, to uh, uh, in the prohibition was from 1920 to th I think around 1935 or so. It was an abject failure, by the way. Uh, and the states passed a constitutional amendment, and what happened was um, it, they thought it would reduce crime. And in fact, there was, you know, the cartels moved in, as it were, and, uh, and, and, and began, you know, they had speakeasies, and uh, wealthy people still had all their booze. The poor people didn't. And, and, and uh, so that was repealed after about 15 years. Um, and I believe it was Roosevelt. Uh, anyway, um, so, but these social movements were all, all, they all, they, they developed into what we now call the social gospel, which is the idea that Christianity can reform and affect our society through a movement of, of, uh, of preaching and teaching and, and, and Etc. And the other thing that came out of the great Third Great Awakening was the World Missionary Movement. Uh, again, main leaders: Dwight L. Moody, Ira Sankey, who wrote a lot of hymns, Bo William Booth, Catherine Booth, who were the founder founders of the Salvation Army, Charles Spurgeon, Billy Sunday, James Coffey. Uh, so, I love. If you've never read a biography of D. L. Moody, you should read it. It's fantastic. This guy was a shoe salesman who, the story goes, wanted to teach Sunday school, and there was such a revival going on in his church that they said, well, no, we don't have room for you. Go find some boys on the street and get them into a class, and if you can teach them for a while, we'll let you be a Sunday school teacher. So Dale Moody hung up his, his shoe business, I guess. I don't know. He began to teach Sunday school, and his classes grew and grew and grew. 
and um, eventually he became, you know, really well known. And then he began to preach. And some of the now, D.L. Moody was a brilliant man. My wife actually learned from him in how to teach Sunday school years ago. People ask, well, how do you keep their attention, these kids off the street? How do you keep their attention? D.L. Moody would teach them for an hour, and he would have something different every five minutes. Seriously, this was his methodology. Some, an act, some activity, maybe it's Bible verse or reading or, or praying or singing. Every five minutes, he changed it up in the Sunday school class. Um, we should tell Hadley about this because he te he's teaching Sunday school back in, in uh, Oklahoma. So, um, so D.L. Moody, amazing guy, one of his great regret was that he had a stadium full of people that he was preaching to for salvation, and he decided not to give the altar call until the next night. And the next day was the great Chicago fire. And he got those people, he never got those people back. His, his great regret was not having an altar call when, uh, just before, <laughs> before the great fire. And some of those people lost their lives in the great Chicago fire. So he, he was, uh, he never forgot that. But Dale Moody's is a great biography to read. Um, William and Catherine Booth, they founded the Salvation Army, which, uh, for many, many, many years, was the largest provider of, of social services in this country besides the government. And I think they're still maybe the third largest organization providing social services. They were focused on the poor, the addicted. Um, they, were, they were part of the holiness movement. I, um, I didn't get in, I didn't mention the holiness movement. I, I'm going to. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, of course, um, was in the line of preachers uh, that probably the, that you could call him a modern day Puritan. Um, his sermons are still very inspiring um, to read. But Billy Sunday, <laughs> my grandmother hated Billy Sunday. He came to her town, Corpus Christi. She moved there in the early 1900s. She was born in 1900. She moved to Corpus Christi from New York in the early 1900s. And when she was a young woman, she went to a Billy Sunday revival. And Billy Sunday was very brash, very brash, uh, to the point of insulting people. And apparently, he had this whole big room full of people and a young lady walks in late and he says, tell that young heifer to get out of here. <laughs> My grandmother did not like Billy Sunday after that. So she told me that story when I was young and uh, <laughs> tell that young heifer to get out of here or be on time, you know. So Billy Sunday was quite the dramatic preacher. Anyway, so... Um, the characteristics of the Third Great Awakening, the holiness movement. The holiness movement was an offshoot originally of Methodism, and it resulted in new denominations like the Nazarene Church. The holiness movement taught that you receive salvation. It was based on, 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 on John Wesley's teachings, you receive salvation, but then you need sanctification. Then you need sanctification. And it, he taught it as though that he, he believed that we can achieve full sanctification in this life. That you, and they define, he defined sin in a unique way. Sin is only conscious sin, which I don't think is biblical. You know, uh, I think you can find places in the scripture that talk about uh, about our 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 motives. And um, I'm um, trying to think of a verse right now. Um, Keep me, O Lord, from secret sins. Anyway, and also high-handed sins. And all, anyway, so he he said um, they define sin as only conscious sin, 
And I actually had a prof once in a seminary, not in an Anglican seminary, at Fuller Seminary, who told me that he hadn't sinned in years. He said it with a straight face. And I'm like, okay, well, we have a different definition of sin because I can't make it through a day without sinning. Um, maybe not an hour. Uh, so I probably sinned since this class started. <laughs> anyway, uh, but the, the holiness movement affected a lot of denominations. There were holiness Quakers. There were holiness Baptists. There were, they were, and they believed that you could achieve this. And, and interestingly enough, the Pentecostal movement kind of came out of, originally out of the holiness movement. And I'm going to get into that. I can't get into Pentecostalism today. I won't, I'm not going to have time. Uh, but Pentecostalism began in the late 1800s, and it began in different places around the world. It began in South Africa, it began in the Middle East, it began in America, all around the same time, which to me shows that it was a sovereign act of God. Um, so we also had such quasi-Christian movements as the Jehovah's Witnesses, started by uh, Charles Taze Russell, uh, who was illiterate. He didn't know Greek or Hebrew. He was once sued by a, sued by a newspaper uh, for claiming that he could translate the, the Bible uh, that the Jehovah's Witnesses use. And he, they put him on the stand and showed him some Greek letters and he couldn't tell what they were. He did not know. He was a completely illiterate man uh, as far as, as, far as, uh, as far as the, the, the Greek and Hebrew language, so he, tries, he translates a Bible that's still used today by the Jehovah's Witnesses that changed key words uh, to, to exclude the divinity of Christ. And really, Charles Hayes Russell resurrected a very ancient heresy called Arianism. Arianism was the reason that the Nicene Creed was created in 325 A.D., and Arianism says that Jesus Christ was the first creation of God, not part of the Trinity, not truly divine. Uh, and so they also have a lot of other beliefs, like, um, I forgot what it's called, but when you, if, you, if you don't go to heaven, you are simply, your life is simply extinguished. There's no hell. I forgot what that's called. Spiritualism, theosophy, uh, thelema, I don't even know what thelema is, uh, uh, Christian science, Christian science is big in New England, it was founded in Boston uh, by Mary Baker Eddy, who wrote uh, a guide to the scriptures, you know, let me ex explain the scripture. Now, they, she believed in healing, in divine healing. But she wasn't an Orthodox Christian. She didn't believe in the Trinity or anything like that. Um, and there's a, there is a, a big, big, gigantic church in the middle of Boston that is the original church. If you've been there, I've seen it. And uh, we used to have a joke about, um, uh, about uh, Christian science, and that was they believed in the fatherhood of God, the uh, the the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, and the neighborhood of Boston. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, uh, some of these are occultic or quasi-occultic uh, sects, if you will. Uh, and then again, through the, another characteristic was the continuation of these social movements that began during the Second Great Awakening. And they resulted in, again, continued uh, founding of colleges and universities like the Moody Bible College, um, missionary societies like the China Inland Mission uh, that, was, um, that was pioneered by Hudson Taylor, who if you have not read Hudson Taylor's, they, you know, there are, in our library, we actually have shorter biographies of some of these people. You don't have to read a book this thick. If you haven't read the story of the China Inland Mission, it is truly amazing and a miraculous how God used this man to go to China and bring about massive numbers of people coming to Christ. The YMCA was a real Christian organization back then. As a matter of fact, it was based on the idea 
that young men needed to be muscular Christians. No wonder they're kind of failing today. Uh, they don't believe in, we don't believe in muscular Christianity anymore, do we, David? No, we don't. We don't believe in muscular, I mean, we believe in it, but those, our society doesn't believe in, because my, my gosh, that would be like toxic masculine Christianity. Uh, so musk, so the white, you know, uh, Oswald Chambers, if you know who he is, what an amazing writer. By the way, he never wrote anything. His wife wrote it all down. She trained to be a stenographer for the king. She was one of the best stenographers in all of England. And then she married him and threw it all away, except that Oswald never wrote anything down. So there she was dutifully recording everything he said. And that's where you get Oswald Chambers' uh, devotional uh, is that his wife wrote everything down. But he was an example. He was a YMCA chaplain. If only we had YMCA chaplains like that today, right? I mean, this guy was all about conversion to Christ and, and discipleship. Uh, anyway, um, and so uh, the women's Christian temperance movements, again, I've mentioned that wasn't just about alcohol. It was about pornography. It was about prostitution. Um, and um, Thomas John Bernardo's uh, founding of orphanages. I actually don't know anything about that. I haven't read it. I, it was in the article that I took this from, but I'm going to look it up. I've actually learned a lot of things. Now, one thing I'm going to say that's really uh, maybe seem very controversial. There were revivals during the Civil War. I did not know that until I read this the other day. There were revivals more in the South than in the North, in the Union, more in the Confederate Army than in the Northern Union Army. Stonewall Jackson and Robert, Lee, Robert E. Lee actually encouraged them. This may mess up your worldview. This may screw things up in your mind because you're thinking, well, they were fighting to keep slavery, but they had over 150,000 converts uh, they didn't pay the chaplains hardly anything. So the various denominations started printing tracts. One Bible, I think it was the Baptist, you know, of course it was the Baptist. <laughs> they alone printed 150 million tracts. And what do you think a soldier is going to do when he is in the trenches He's out alone. There's no internet. There's no phones. There's no letters. And he's been given a track. They also printed tons of New Testaments. New Testaments. These guys had nothing to do but read the New Testament and tracks. 150 million tracks by one by the Baptist Bible Society. Um, and so there were great revivals. This revival was was based more not so much on large group meetings but informal meetings with soldiers uh, and some preaching but also testimonies of of converted lives and then private bible reading from the scriptures that they got and again in in the confederate army alone in like 1863 alone 150,000 converted to christ I mean, that's amazing. So, um, so anyway, um, I've got it. I'm doing, I'm celebrating at the next service. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm hoping that what we've been talking about here is going to spur your interest. I mean, for, go on the internet, just look up any of these subjects, look up second grade awakening, first grade awakening, look up, uh, Civil War revivals. Look these things up and and sit there. I find it so fascinating. I, to be honest, I I, I woke up at four a.m. and I couldn't go back to sleep, so I went in the living room, and I just started rereading some of these articles and clicking on new articles and stuff. And it's fascinating material uh, to learn about the histories of what God has done in this country through evangelism through even the social movements. I mean, it's fascinating. Uh, so 
Uh, I thought the social gospel actually started, you know, in the 1950s or 60s. No, it goes back further than that, a lot further. So anyway, um, I've, got to, I've got to end this, so let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you again for all that you have done and all that you are doing, not only in this country, but in many, many other countries around the world. Lord, you are, you are focused and you are intent upon reaching the lost with the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, with your love, Lord. And so, God, we just pray that we can do our part in, in bearing witness to him and in praying for a movement of your Holy Spirit here in El Paso and Juarez. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Good to see you again. Uh, so next week, I'm going to show another video, 30 minutes long, amazing video by J. Edwin Orr on the Welsh Revival. The Welsh Revival.